iPhone 14. Three major things that are new with the 14 Pro. Those being the internals, the display, and the cameras. So there's not a whole lot of new pieces in this new phone, but there's technically more in this one than the baseline iPhone 14, because this one actually gets a silicon upgrade to the new A16 Bionic and 6 gigs of RAM, top of the line, new 4 nanometer system on a chip, to the A13 Bionic from a couple years ago. In real life though, so far, it's benchmarked very similar to an A15 Bionic, just slightly above, as expected, and that's meant, for me, rock solid performance fluid animations, and a pretty reliable all-day battery life from both the 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max. Yeah, on screen, it'll automatically... Now, eSIM only. eSIM isn't exactly a new thing, but not having a physical SIM tray anymore does have its pros and cons. Pros mainly being, okay, it's one less place for water to get in, one less moving part, but cons being that for international travel, if you just wanted to grab a SIM card real quick instead of going through the carriers, and is now impressively so can also communicate with straight up satellites instead of cell towers. So it'll take longer and you'll need a clear view of the sky and the UI will literally help you point your phone at a certain satellite overhead, but it will let you send messages to a dispatcher or local emergency services to help get to your location. slightly larger and thicker than the 13 Pros. But bottom line is when an iPhone 13 Pro can fit in an iPhone 14 Pro's case, and you know, it's pretty close. Okay, so now we're really getting into the meat of what you really start to notice on these new phones. iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max have some slightly updated 6.1 inch and 6.7 inch OLED displays respectively. So there's still excellent displays on paper with slightly thinner bezels that you won't notice and slightly higher resolution that you also won't notice, and an even higher, brighter 2000 nits peak brightness that you absolutely will notice when looking at the phone on like a bright sunny day. It looks great at 100%. Out of the most often here are the dynamic island and the always on display. The always on display is the perfect example of the classic Apple late mover strategy. Like this is not a new feature. This has been on hundreds of phones before for many years. But now it's finally coming to an iPhone, and so it's being done the Apple way this time. The thing is, I don't really know that there's any advantages to this looks this. like this. So you hit the power button, you sweep the phone, you put it down, the brightness drops, the LTPO OLED display goes all the way down to 1 hertz, and you get to see the clock and notifications roll in as if your lock screen is still on. From the home screen to the always on display, is really nice. It's got this smooth fade animation. And I think that's the Apple way. Like the clock, if it's behind something, will graduate to the front of the always on display. And it maintains all the colors and skin tones in whatever wallpaper you were using. So it's not faded or black and white. You still have all your color. If you've got music playing, then your album art is front and center. It is extra beautiful creative always on displays over the years that let me customize and dial in even differently from the lock screen and I really love using them. Apple's is just a toggle and a turn off, don't get me wrong. If it's in a pocket, it turns off. If you're in sleep mode, it turns off. Even when you have an Apple Watch on and you walk far enough away from the phone that it knows you can't Remember the rumors of the new Pro iPhone replacing the notch with an I-shaped cutout in the top of the display with all those runners people made? Well. That's actually what this is. It has one circular cutout on the right for a new selfie camera and one pill-shaped cutout on the left for the new Face ID hardware, which they've shrunk down by about 30% to fill in this smaller area. And then instead of just doing that, Apple has cleverly decided to fill in the gap between them with like this, which doesn't show up in screenshots or screen recordings. It's just a gap. But there are about 30 different things that it does to indicate ongoing activities and background activities and things that are all beautifully animated and super smooth with these fluid physics. It's so friendly and approachable and all of these things that it does 
show up because that already uses the now playing API. They already had a lock screen widget. Same with SoundCloud, same with YouTube Music and Pocket Casts. So you have album art and the color matching waveform up there while the media is playing. If you tap it, it'll open the app that's playing. And if you long press it, you actually get a widget that pops up with some media controls like in Scrub and everything. Pretty much the exact same widget that would appear in the lock screen. So this feels kind of backwards. I think a tap should open the widget and then a long press should open the app and that would just make more sense, but whatever. The point is, it just works right off the rip. Matter of fact, here's everything that the Dynamic Island does right out the box on day one. So it does system alerts like for incoming calls, connecting AirPods, plugging into a charger, switching the ringer to silent mode or volume on, face ID unlocking, connecting AirPods, and a whole bunch more. There's a full list. And then it's also a UI for live activities happening in the background. So an ongoing call or music playing in the background, any media, a timer counting down, maps directions as you navigate in the background, voice memos recording, screen recording, all that stuff. So here's a full list of that as well. And then any third-party app that uses the Now Playing or Call Kit APIs, which there are many. It also has a little spot for the indicator for microphone and camera access right in between the background activity account. looks like this. But then if I have a second one, if I go start a new background activity, it splits the island into two. So now you can pick between them and then quickly swap between them with a single touch. Bionic that handles all these animations and there's a lot of them that really pull this whole thing together. There's physics to it. You just, you poke the cutout and it wobbles and moves around a little like it's alive. And since there are real cutouts like holes in the display for the camera and the face ID system, it has to be touch sensitive in areas around the actual cutout so that it can still register taps when you touch a dead zone on the screen. On and on, sit all right, if you watch enough, of every iPhone camera since they first came out, they've been confidently repeating the 12 megapixel sensor since the iPhone 6S. But this year we got a leap. We got the leap. The primary camera on the iPhone 14 Pro is now a new 48 megapixel sensor. It's 65% larger than the one we had on the 12 Pro. It has a second generation focus shift optical image stabilization, 100% focus pixels, and sits behind the new. That's gonna bend down to 12 megapixels for all your normal photos, but you do get the benefits of sharpness and more light gathering from a larger sensor. That also gives you faster shutter speeds to freeze motion more often in non-perfect conditions. And it lets me take low light photos with a shorter shutter time, which is very convenient. But the larger sensor also gives you a really nice, shallow, natural depth of field without portrait mode, more than we've ever seen from an iPhone camera. Now, other phones I've seen do this just as well, but it presents a new set of challenges like fringing and autofocus. But I've been very impressed with how well the iPhone deals with both. Not a whole ton of fringing on close-up subjects, and 100% coverage with focus pixels has been pretty locked in on tracking subjects and keeping things in focus, even with the shallow depth of field. My only complaint really is the pretty weak minimum focus distance. Things get blurred when you get close to the primary camera, so you gotta switch to the macro mode pretty early. Luckily, the ultra wide has some improvements too, so that's not the end of the world. Then, a 48 megapixel sensor also enables this new 2X button. Doesn't seem like that huge of a deal, but it's literally just cropping in on the middle 12 megapixels of this huge sensor. So it's essentially like an optical zoom. It's not like you're gonna lose quality the way anything less than 3X would have been before on iPhones because it was cropping into an already 12 megapixel image. The 48 megapixel sensor also enables this new action mode in video, which is this super aggressive stabilization for really shaky video. And it does this with a pretty heavy crop, but it's also able to still shoot in up to 2.8K in this mode. A uh, little pro tip, it defaults to the 0.5x camera. It's much noisier when you do this so, so I, I do recommend switching back to the primary for it. And then if you're running around chasing a subject or even pointing out a car window or just anytime you need some pretty heavy stabilization, this is definitely nice to have. If you want the full 48 megapixel files, you can shoot in pro raw and it will kick out 50, 60, 70 megabyte DNG files, which have a lot of detail and latitude to push around in Lightroom and make them look better than the straight out of camera 12 megapixel shots. 
but I'll leave that to the Peter McKinnons and Tyler Stallmans or the many other photography creators it I know. You can definitely overbake HDR sometimes in some harsh shooting conditions. And the new selfie camera, which now has 12 megapixels and autofocus, the overall oh, versatility of the whole camera system. You know, the shutter speed improvements, the quality of the photos, the great autofocus, the color consistency between the three different cameras, the overall image processing pipeline improvements that have made the ultra wide much more usable and less noisy and low light. And then of course the ProRes video that I'm literally actively running an entire YouTube channel guides and with. teardowns on their channel. Uh, it's not as hard as it looks. Also, if you want to see the inside of your phone before you try to fix it, check out iFixit's channel so you can see their iPhone 14 teardown when they take apart tech so you can learn how to fix it yourself. So you can check them out.